in church. Everyone is asked to bring a salad or a dessert. There's probably more information coming on that in the coming weeks. Got a couple birthdays this week that I don't believe are here today. Upcoming events at UCC, the women of the church are meeting following service today. And next Sunday, I have a pair of seniors that will be honored, which makes me very old. Those are my youngest. <laughs> Seemed like they were just, that, that went fast. That went really fast. Anyway, we'll have some cake and coffee, I think, next week. So, Are there any other announcements? Sure. Thank you. Any other announcements? All right. If you could please join me in the call to worship. We gather in the name of the risen Lord. We gather as sisters and brothers of the resurrected one. We gather to share our faith and to worship God. We gather to proclaim the good news of Easter. God of the resurrection, we gather this morning as a community of believers. We come with joy to greet one another and to tell again and again the amazing news. Christ is risen. Love is victorious over death. You have given us new life in the name of your son. May our singing, praying, listening, and proclaiming be a testimony to the power of your love to make us a new creation as a community of faith. We pray in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is Joy Dawned Again on Easter Day 241 in the Black Hymnal. Please be seated. Please be seated. I'm not as tall as he is. Morning, church. Good morning. It is good to be among the people of God at this time and in this place. Before we um, continue, I should I should have mentioned my wife Beth. She's a she's from Geneva, and she um, decided that that one wacko Congregationalist from Geneva today was enough uh, for one week. She'll come probably next week. I I don't know. Um, she's got her own social calendar, so she kind of does her own thing. Um, but it's, it's uh, this third time's the charm. I think we scheduled this a couple other times when I had an illness and a conflict. I managed to dodge COVID for three and a half years and then got it in, in December. So, um, but it is really a joy to be here. As I was driving across country from Indiana, um, I, I noticed I was in Nebraska when the wind started blowing. <laughs> you gotta stop cutting all the trees down. You know, there's just nothing to stop the wind, but um, it, it does feel like I've come home. Um, I've been in this building four other times. Uh, I think the first time was a 
clergy cluster that Bev Hayes hosted when I, we had our clergy cluster meetings once a month. And then I think the last time was Ethan's installation. So, um, so it feels like, kind of like coming home. And I'm glad all of you could make it. Sorry we ran out of bulletins. If you, but I think things are on the screen, right? So we're, we're good. Um, or share with a neighbor. Or if they try to snatch it from you, just try to be Christian. So we uh, join together in our prayer of confession. Um, it's very traditional to do these weekly during Lent. We don't always do them weekly during the Easter season, but um, I think it's good to come on Sunday and think about the things that maybe we didn't get right during the week. So will you join me in prayer? I think I have to invite you, don't I? Oh no, we go right into the prayer, okay. Let us pray. God of mercy, we come celebrating our unity but we confess the many ways that we are divided. Our nationality, ethnic origin, economic status, gender, age, and musical preferences all too often obscure the common calling we share in Christ's name. May our common identity as your children and our communal witness to Christ bind us together in your name. Forgive our tendency toward separation and division, and remind us that we are your Easter people. When we walk in the light of Christ, we have fellowship with one another. When we confess our sins, the one who is faithful and just forgives our sins and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. For in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has showered mercy upon the entire world. In the name of Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. If you would, uh, respecting one another's boundaries for potential flu germs, um, greet your neighbors with the peace of Christ. An elbow bump or a bow is okay if you don't want to shake hands. But the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share the peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ. You're good, she didn't even have to play a note. To... I was told by a mentor once that you never pass the piece before the offering because somebody might sneak out. But, but I think you're all still here. Now, I don't know what your tradition is for doing the prayer time. I don't know if we lift up those that are perhaps listed in your bulletin or if you verbally share. But it's been my tradition that we come together at this time to to share three things 
those things that might be weighing our hearts down, concerns, those things that might be lifting our hearts up, joys, and also what I call glory sightings or God sightings, the ways you might have seen God at work in your life, the life of maybe somebody you love or in the world this week. Um, my glory sighting was that I got here safely from Indiana. That's always good when you're out there on the highways that nothing happened, the car worked well, and the weather was, we drove in rain the first day, but that was okay. Um, and then I have a, a concern. I'm just going to throw my brother Jack out there for you to pray for. He's uh, battling a, a limb, lympho, uh, some kind of cancer that's in the lymph system. And uh, the, every other day it seems like there's something else that goes wrong and another doctor that comes on board. So um, he's technically cancer-free, but a lot of stuff's just not working right. So prayers for Jack. He's in Northern California. So what might you have to share this morning? Joys or concerns? You're a quiet bunch. Not your custom, I can tell. Yes? It was a joy to run out of bulletins. Joy to run out of bulletins, yeah. That's always a joy. It's a joy to see all the kids here this morning, too. So. Continue to keep our daughter, Jody, guessing in your prayers. Daughter Jody, okay. Jody and Jack so far, and, and Joys. We've got Jays going. That's what happened. Yeah. See what happens when you get married when you're eight years old. <laughs> Extra points. But, uh, I guess I, I, I have another joy. How are your brackets doing? <laughs> Except for Kentucky, going ahead and going to the Final Four. I have the two teams that are in the championship, in the championship, and according to ESPN, I'm in the 99th percentile, which means I'm the 317,000th best bracket of the 40 million that are entered. So don't think it's any, going to win any money. But Well, let us pray. Gracious God, in the silence, in the silence, it's, it's easy to kind of let the cares go away and to listen for your voice, to feel your presence, to feel your spirit in this place. But then we'll leave today and we'll get busy. We'll forget that with every step we take, you are walking beside us. We'll forget that with every tear, you cry with us. We'll forget that with every joy you celebrate with us. Help us, Lord, to be mindful of your presence in our lives and in the lives that we love. And help us look for your presence in the world, for you are there. Sometimes that's hard to see. Lord, help us to be Easter people, people of the resurrection. People that share the joy we have in following this Nazarene carpenter. Lord, we lift those concerns and joys we've mentioned. We are thankful that so many are here this morning. We also lift those things that are on our hearts, which you know oh so well. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us. And we lift all of this to you in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, there, there isn't one printed in the bulletin, but I think since we have so many kids here this morning, it's time for what I call the story for the young at heart. So really, I'm inviting anybody up that feels young. But if there are kids that aren't too shy to come up, I invite you up and we'll, we'll have a little conversation on the steps.
that age where I don't remember them as well. So um, I probably remember one or two of you. But, but. but we're, we're going to talk about something. You know what Sunday this is? How many of you were in church last week? Easter Sunday. Did you, did you go to anything fun for Easter? Did you have? Well, that's at least a good tradition. Um, well, this is this is Easter Sunday. Again, we have a whole bunch of them. Easter is not just a day. Did you know that? It's a season in the church. It lasts for 50 days. So we're only eight days into it today, right? And today we get to hear a scripture about, um, have any of you ever heard of the disciple named Thomas? Okay, he's one of the 12 disciples that went with Jesus. And he gets a bad rap. He's called Thomas the Doubter. Because, you know, Jesus rose from the dead on Easter, right? And all the disciples were hiding in a room. And then Jesus comes in and says, and they're locked, the door's locked. Also, Jesus appears among them and says, Peace be with you. And they see the risen Jesus and they celebrate. Well, Thomas wasn't there. He was the only one of them that wasn't there. So he doubted for a week until he saw Jesus later. So I'm going to see how much how much faith you have in these that you don't know me from Adam or Noah. Or, um, it's a bad biblical reference. How many people think that I can do a good card trick? That old guy. No? Put that one down. How about this one? Is this your card? No? So none of those are your cards. See, you don't have faith. So you, you figured that none of these are, that I couldn't match that you make your card appear here, right? Because you've never seen me do this before, right? So you're doubting right now that I can do this, just like Thomas doubted about Jesus. All right. Is that your card?
here. And thank you, that, thank you to Jack West, the late Jack West, who taught me that trick some 50, 45 years ago, probably. Oop. Obviously, if I was doing supply in a Methodist church, we never would have done that. Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I kind of forgot that um, when Chad, Chad and I were talking that I'm here three Sundays and not four, because really my best Sunday was going to be that third week that <laughs> the sermon was in. Anyway. But it, it's, really a, it's really a conflict this year on which stream to follow and preach on, because it's the epistles of John, the letters of John, and then of course we hear the story from the gospel of John about uh, what happens after the resurrection. So I'm trying to work both of them in. This, year, this week we'll focus more on the gospel. Next week we'll focus more on the epistles, but they do complement one another. This is uh, essentially the first chapter of the first letter of John. He writes, We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And then our gospel reading is from John, the 20th chapter, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, "Eh, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hand and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, 
his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. And in all these words, may we hear the words of God. Amen. Before COVID, I was a real roamer when I preached, and then I kind of, you know, got in the pulpit when we opened up, basically because people don't want me spitting on them, but um, I've been a roam a little bit today, if that's all right. It's just a little more comfortable for me, although I might, if you start giving me certain looks, I'll probably go back and hide in the pulpit again. <laughs> when I was 15, I was in love. Her name was Nancy Guthrie, and she was years old and she had the most beautiful long dark blonde hair longer than mine is that's a joke <laughs> not really but <laughs> well I was dutifully at the Willis United Methodist Church every Sunday morning for Sunday school and worship Sunday evenings would find me at the other end of Catherine Lane at the Willis Baptist Church sitting next to my sweetheart at evening worship now, I have to admit that worship service was a bit longer than the one I went to in the morning, but it didn't matter because I was sitting next to my girlfriend, Nancy. I loved her so much that that summer I decided to go to my first church, well, not my first church camp, but my first real church camp, a teenage church camp, at uh, Sierra Christian Camp above Modesto in the Sierras, a Baptist camp. And uh, it was a really neat facility. It had a, a big... Log, uh, you know, lodge that they'd built. Um, it had an old chapel, Gold Rush era chapel they'd pulled in, a uh, great dining hall, small lake, um, and a bunch of breezy cabins. They just had screens around the top, no windows. And all the way down one side of the property that came into play one of the last nights when we played a in the dark version of Capture the Flag. Well, there were, I don't know, eight or nine cabins full of boys and about probably six or seven of girls. And Nancy was in the roof cabin, and I was in the Thomas cabin. Yes, I was a doubter. But I want you to know, it was random, and the guys we had in our cabin, we did pretty well at some of the games. We won most of them. Matter of fact, it was two of us from that cabin were the only ones that made it to the flag that night. I better stay a little bit on my script or I'll go on forever. Um, there was one cabin, of course, that everybody wanted. It really rocked. You know where I'm going with this. Peter cabin, right? They wanted to be part of the Peter cabin because that was the rock in which Peter, or Jesus built his church. But they could only have 20-some guys like ours did. They didn't win a lot of games. But is this cutting in and out? Yeah. yeah. I'll go back up to the... It's probably a battery or something. Or it might be me. They were pretty outspoken. They didn't win a lot of games, but by being outspoken, they stayed in character. Anyway, this long introduction to my message today, I hope resonates a little bit with you, or should resonate with many of us that are sitting here this morning. I mean, how many of us identify with Peter more than we do with Thomas? How many of us would like, at least, to identify with Peter? I know that's what we'd like to do. But I'm guessing that many of us would probably say we're a little bit more like the doubter than the rock. After all, the world we live in today is challenging. I got my allergies kicking up, sorry. We see that church continue to be more and more ignored. A lot of our uh, younger folks think that we've become irrelevant. We see war that we can't seem to get past and poverty that we can't seem to eradicate. 
We have political leaders, and I'm not going to throw in one party or another because I'll lump them all together here. I don't think many of them wake up in the morning and say, I want to find God's will for my life today. I, don't, I just don't think that happens with a lot of them. And we're not eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus like the original apostles were. So I came home from that camp experience wrestling with my call, and I was only 15. I'd already preached my first sermons. Um, I was preaching a lot. Um, but I was a typical teenager during those challenging times in California, no less. So I, I churched, and I schooled, and I sportsed, is that a verb? And I, and I worked, and I partied, and I, you know, I had my compartmentalized boxes in my life. And I had my doubts then, just as I still have some doubts today. Yeah, it means I'm not a perfect follower of Jesus Christ. But, folks, none of us are. So somehow, when I became a Thomas the Doubter that summer, it made sense. And it probably set the wheels in motion for my denying my call for 20-plus years, filling me maybe more with doubts than a surety that God could use even me. I know it's been a long lead-in, but I'm introducing our worship series that I designed for the month, which I'm calling Living into Easter, although maybe I should have called it Leaning into Easter. Because we need to continually remind ourselves this time of year, I think, that Easter is not a day, it's a season. We need to also constantly remind ourselves of who we are and whose we are. We are children of God and we are persons of worth. Those, that's known as COGPOWs, if you, that's the acronym for that. I just love that I'm a COGPOW. Thomas was a COGPOW, even with all the doubt, just as we in this 21st century are COGPOWs, even with our own doubts. And so the epistles of John will dovetail those in because he's willing, he's, he's really trying to strengthen people's faith and chase away their doubts in these letters. And he does that by talking about love and, and testifying to eyewitness accounts to the life and resurrection of Jesus, to the fact that God is light, to the forgiveness of sin. Verse 4 this morning he says, the reason he does this is so that our joy might be complete. Well, that's being Easter people, having complete joy. So we'll visit these passages each week of the series as there's lots of meat on the bones here, dealing with creation, salvation, uh, love, and adoration, and how by loving as Jesus loved, we might have the joy that he writes about in verse 4. And we don't have to be perfect to experience any of it. We just need to have faith, we need to believe, but as we're going to find out this morning, having doubt along the way is natural, and it can lead to some positive impacts in our lives as well. So let's turn to the gospel, uh, Thomas the Doubter. You know, today is um, the first Sunday after Easter, or the second Sunday of Easter, I like to call it, but it also has a horrible nickname. I don't know if you know this. This is called Low Sunday. Now, you, you buck the trend, you, you're here, but this is one of the worst attended Sundays in the Christian church. The week after Easter, everybody's gotten, you know, they've done it all for Easter and they take a week off. There's a lot of pastors that actually take this week off. Um, but last week, if you think about it, it represented the triumph of the Christian year. We announced to the world the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus died and rose again to new life for love of us. It's easy to lean into Easter on Easter Sunday, but then we seem to forget. The result is that the next Sunday, this Sunday, is the lowest attendance across the whole church. So it leads us preachers to say, ouch, was it something I said? <laughs> well, maybe it was. The gospel of the resurrection, the concept of the resurrection is a little, frankly, hard to wrap our heads around sometime. You know, the resurrection doesn't appear in the Bible at all. The story of Jesus, he's put in a tomb. Next thing we know, it's an empty tomb. The actual act of the resurrection remains something that's between him and his father. We don't witness that. So, in a way, you know, it, it, it leads me to some questions. So today we hear the story of doubting Thomas, who has many questions of his own. I would say that Thomas, along with Peter, are the most human of the disciples. And this story is rich with those interesting questions. The first thing we notice is that Thomas misses out on Jesus' first appearance to the disciples. It's, it's Sunday night, and the disciples have been hiding in a locked room since Friday in fear for their lives. 
but not Thomas. So we ask the question, where is he? Why isn't he with the others? Was he terrified and, and hiding by himself? You know, not wanting to be found by the Romans right in the middle of a pack of ringleaders of Jesus' rebellion? Was he maybe instead full of stoic courage, the only one brave enough to go out and get food for the rest of them? We don't know. But whatever it was, he wasn't there on that first Easter Sunday when Jesus appeared in the locked upper room. He missed the resurrection. Many of us, I think, can identify with that sort of frustrated futility. We, we wonder if we're missing the resurrection in a lot of areas of our lives. God is raising things to new life and our attention is elsewhere, checked out, missing in action like Thomas was. Now Thomas does eventually show up with the rest of the disciples and they tell him, we've seen the Lord. And what's he supposed to think? If he was the only one who had been brave enough to leave, he's watched his brothers and friends driven nearly mad with fear and grief over the three days. He probably feels great compassion and love for them. They so desperately want their dead friend and leader not to have been condemned to death and executed. They've dreamed up this vision that they've experienced. And who knows? Thomas wouldn't put it past Jesus to come back to him as a ghost. I mean, Lord knows he did stranger things when he was alive. But he's no longer alive, he's dead. Thomas knows that denying it won't help anyone. He's never brought back any of the rest of the family and friends that he's lost over the years, and he figures it won't bring back Jesus. Thomas remains in this state, unable to trust the word of his friends for an entire week. What was that week like for him, do you think? The rest of his disciple, the disciples were floating on air, knowing that Jesus had been raised for the dead. But where was Jesus in all that time? Why did he leave the disciples alone? It's like low Sunday. Last Sunday we saw him raised from the dead. Now we're, we're back and starting to wonder, did we really see what we thought we saw? At least we've witnessed him alive. Thomas is only his own stubbornness to keep him going stubbornness and maybe just maybe a little spark of hope because what made Thomas stick around for an entire week with what he believed to be friends that were uh, driven to delusions of grief if Jesus was truly dead then there was nothing left for him anymore with this group of people by all rights he should have gone home to his fields or his fishing boat or whatever it was that Thomas did remaining with the disciples is a dead end the longer they stay together, the greater the danger of being arrested by the Romans. Spending time with them will only serve to bring home every minute of every day that their friend Jesus was dead. But Thomas stayed. Is it possible that even through his doubt, a small part of him wondered if this story that his friends were telling him might possibly be true? He reveals himself a bit in his answer to their claim that they've seen the Lord. He says, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. He doesn't say, you people are crazy, I'm leaving. He sets up a hypothetical condition under which he will believe in the resurrection. He's laying out a challenge to Jesus is what he's doing. He's saying, come and show me, Jesus. Come and prove it to me. Come to me on my terms. Thomas wants to be tough and uncaring and skeptical, but, oh, he loved Jesus. He's grieving as deeply as the others, and although they're now joyful since seeing him alive again, Thomas has had no such comfort. He's throwing out this challenge to provoke Jesus into coming to them again, because Thomas just wants to see his friend. Ghost or vision or real person, it doesn't matter. And Jesus does not disappoint. Thomas has had a grim week, the, least, the lone skeptic among the believers. But as soon as Jesus arrives, as soon as he bids them peace, he calls Thomas immediately over and says, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. How fascinating and revealing, I think, that even in his resurrected body, Jesus' wounds remain. And how very appropriate to Thomas's story, and I think to our own, right? And this is the gospel message for us today. 
Resurrection is possible for us in so many areas of our lives. But our wounds will remain. Our, the scars that, painful as they are in the making, have made us indelibly who we are. Jesus is resurrected to new life, but he's still himself. And he helps Thomas recognize him through his wounds. That's a potent lesson for us. When we look at ourselves and each other, part of the proof of our true resurrection is that the past is brought forward to coexist with the present. Our wounds are not erased as though they'd never existed. They're still present, but they just no longer cause us pain. They're proof to one another that we're new and whole, but it was our woundedness that got us to this day of resurrection in the first place. There was one other thing that happened on Low Sunday in the early church. Those who were baptized on Easter received a new white robe, and they wore it all week. On Low Sunday, they took it off and went back to their regular clothes. There's something very poignant about that, I think, in our story of Thomas. Today is the day when the loud and public festivities are over. We return to our normal, everyday lives. But today is also the day of resurrection for Thomas. It's the day when the new white robe falls away and Thomas sees the wounds on Jesus' body, the same physical person that he knew and loved and now recognizes as both wounded and whole, alive and breathing. The question is, can we recognize that same type of resurrection in ourselves and in each other? When the fancy Easter dresses and suits are put away for another year, what's left? Our same wounded selves that we fear to show to one another. But we need proof of the resurrection, and we will only find that in each other. If we're brave enough to show each other our wounded places, we find that they don't hurt so much. We'll find that we are indeed both wounded and healed. Thomas was a week late to the resurrection, but he made it all the same. Where do you find yourself today? There's still time for you to come back to life. Easter season's 50 days long. If you reach out and touch the wounded living Jesus, you will feel him touch your wounded living soul. And then and only then, we can live in the world as resurrection people. We can lean into Easter. And we can help others with their wounds as we seek to love as Jesus loved. And as we seek to change the world, one wounded person at a time. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to be people of the resurrection. Help us to be Easter people that proclaim the joy of Easter while realizing that the wounds remain. You take away the pain, but we are who we are by where we've been and where we are now. Help us to reach out to each other in healing, in love, and in the joy of the resurrection. And let us spread that news to all we meet. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You would rise in body or spirit and join me in number 253. Yours is the glory. <laughs>
may be seated. All that we have belongs to God. As we celebrate our unity as a community of faith and focus our hearts on the risen Christ, we joyfully lay our possessions at God's table. Through the grace of God and the bounty of this church, we have the ability to share our gifts so that all may have what they need to live. We thank God for the opportunity to truly be in fellowship with one another and with the world through our offerings today. We will now receive the morning offering. Do we pray before we receive it? Okay. Customs are different. Depends on where you go. Oh, obviously we do because it's before the doxology, so yeah, I should know that. Let us pray. Generous and surprising God, when we thought that death had claimed your only son, you amazed us with the resurrection. Surprise us again with your ability to turn these humble offerings into gifts that will transform the world through our witness to your love. We lay our very lives at your feet, O oh God, knowing that you will use us to proclaim and embody the gospel. Amen. See if the microphone behaves. Uh, I'll just, yeah, I'm use my, Ron, out. Let me know. I think it's cutting out still, isn't it? I could use the school teacher voice I inherited from my mother. But. As we gather at the table well, this morning, before we get into the the liturgy that you're used to, um, on the trip from Indiana, um, detouring to check out a steel place. For my new roof. Uh, I also detoured through Richardson County and I drove up, oh, I don't know, nine or ten miles of county road, took a wrong turn, um, ended up on minimum maintenance, but the Buick made it. Um, luckily it wasn't planting season yet, so we made it. <laughs> but we went to the first church I pastored that I, 20 years ago, served my first communion in. Um, they, uh, Doors they put in the wrong way because they fit better. So basically, you need to get out, but you. And I said the sermon goes long. And because you know, there's no lock on the door, and uh, um, it hasn't changed. I mean, <laughs> the same blue walls. I think maybe the pew cushions might have been upgraded, um, but you know, it. Two thousand years ago, Jesus gathered for a family meal. three and a half years together on dusty roads. But that night that they gathered together, he made that ordinary meal extraordinary by saying a few words. But folks, it's still a family meal. Last Sunday, I'm, I'm guessing over a billion Christians joined together in communion. The first Sunday of the month, probably over a billion Christians joined together in this meal. And whether you like it or not, a little morsel of bread and a little thimble of juice is a meal that can fill you like no other, if you let it. So my prayer is that you'll let that happen. Let us join together in our communion liturgy, gathering at the table of the Lord. We come to the table of the Lord. We come to honor you, O Christ. For when your time came to face the cross, you gave us this meal to remember you and to remember the meaning of your life and your death. At supper with your friends, you took bread, and after you had given thanks, you broke it, gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper was over, you took the cup again, the common beverage of the 
once you had given thanks, you offered to them, and again, saying, This covenant of new life in my blood. Grace we eat and we drink. And we Amen. Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, consecrate these gifts and bless us that we receive them at this table, that we might offer you our faith and praise. We might be united with Christ and with one another, and we might continue to be faithful in all things. We come to this meal remembering that in the United Church of Christ we have an open table. All are invited to Christ's feast of love. You do not need to be a member of this church or any church. Simply one who wants a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we are going to, I'm, I'm not going to foul this up. They gave me instructions so I should be good. So um, I think I, so and you come up by sides. You know, it's a, it, it is a reverent moment. But it's also, God wants us to be joyful and laugh. And it's a family meal. And I don't know about your family meals, but at times we laughed. At times we didn't. But uh, today is a day of joy, for it is the day where we proclaim living Christ. Offering him to each other. So, the feast is ready. Come from this side first, and you'll come up and go down that way. So, you'll be on this. bread of life. And that's the cup of heaven. Or as I like to say, this is Jesus' way of saying he loves you. Bread of life. Bread of life.
bread of life. And switch actually, I didn't even think about it. I didn't realize you were coming from the other side until I saw you. The bread of life. 20 years you think I get this one once in a while. The bread of life. bread of life. This is the bread of life. Jim, bread of life. You just sit there. I'll make you walk up the stairs with it. This is the bread of life. there anyone that didn't make it up that we need to serve in the pews? Yeah. No, I, yeah. I'm just asking out here. We didn't forget you. I thought everybody made it. This is the life. May our Savior Jesus Christ keep and preserve us. You and known the presence of Christ and have received all of Christ's gifts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Number 249 is our closing hymn. Peace I leave with you. Please rise in body or spirit.
wasn't the only one that didn't know that. <laughs> but, you know, we were, picking, we were picking it up there by the third refrain or fourth refrain. So, um, always good to learn new stuff. Um, just at, when I get done saying what I've got to say, just say Christ is risen, hallelujah, we'll go off script. We go from this place as Easter people as people of the resurrection, to share joy, to share love, to proclaim that Christ is risen. We go from this place in doubt, because we're human, and that's natural. Go let the joy and the, your faith overcome the doubts, so that you might be an agent of healing to all you meet. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Go in peace.